next lecture sponsored by Precision Point Diagnostics. Chronically ill and stuck, a first step forward, the role of the microcirculation and immunologic response to foods, presented by Dr. Cheryl Burdett. Cheryl Burdett, ND, is the Director of Education and the Neuropathic Residency Program at Progressive Medical. She directs an accredited naturopathic residency program that is focused on integrative medicine and nutritional biochemistry. She is the founder and educational director of a functional laboratory, Precision Point Diagnostics, formerly Dunwoody Labs, for which she designs clinical profiles and trains clinicians with utilization. She is the research and outreach director for, for Zymogen an Inc. 500 supplement company and serves on their BOA. She is a partner in Theradura, a physician line distribution in Germany. She has synthesized her extensive background in teaching into an online classroom, Logics Health Academy, that provides extensive recordings and protocols in integrative medicine. It is my pleasure to turn it over to you, Dr. Burdett. Thank you, Aria, for that warm intro. I'm excited to be here with you today. Uh, excited to share some information with you. And I'm going to talk about some of the testing at Precision Point, talk about some of the uniqueness of it and, and how it helps us clinically, but also wanted to shed some light on some interesting things that are happening when we change the diet around foods that create an inflammatory response. And so these are often our most challenging, or these are by definition our most challenging patients, the ones that are chronically ill and they're very stuck in place. And we, um, we think about and we've, and we've worked with them in terms of gut work and detox and we're doing that piece of it, but we can't seem to get them to move forward. And maybe at this moment in time, it becomes ultra important to look back to foods they're having a reaction to and really get strict with that piece of it because this can be paramount to helping them move forward. We're gonna talk about kind of a new frontier here, uh, a new way of looking at what food sensitivities and, uh, and creating infl an inflammatory response because of foods can do to us. So we're going to look at the impact of foods beyond leaky gut. That's a story that we're all familiar with, but it turns out there's another part of the tissue that becomes leaky. That is the tissue bed itself, uh, secondary to what's happening in the vasculature. So we're gonna look at capillaries. We're gonna look at the role of microcirculation in chronic disease. And we are going to help learn to and, and see how it is uh, related to chronic disease, but also how this ties into even acute things that are going on right now, specifically like COVID. And I think COVID uh, gives us at least academically an interesting window into uh, what happens with inflammation, because we're all very familiar with now that when we talk about this condition, we're not really talking about a pulmonary condition, but we're talking about impact due to cytokines, things that happen secondary to inflammation. And while this happens in a very extreme way and very fast in a condition like COVID, this also is, reminds us of, of what is happening in our chronically ill patients in terms of uh, cytokines as well. And so essentially what we get with COVID is a sped up model of what is happening in our chronic patients every day. And of course we immediately see the tie-in because when we think about who has comorbidities for COVID, we all begin to think of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, even asthma. And inherent in these is the production of those cytokines. And we're gonna look at what that does to microcirculation and how the foods we eat relates to us. We're going to also look to see the different signs of when we're having IgE reactions, IgG reactions, and also complement responses to foods. 
And so, like I mentioned, I'm here with Precision Point and uh, that we were formerly Dunwoody Labs. And so I want to talk to you today about um, some of our testing, not all, but we want to we'll look at our Precision Antigen 88. And this measures four independent ways that we have inflammatory reactions to foods. And so what we know is that when we make an IgE response or an IgG response that sets off a certain host of symptoms, and we can go to PubMed and certainly we can find um, a, a plethora of literature that talks about IgE related allergies. Uh, but as you do this literature review, um, what we see is that the IgG data has really continued to build over the past decade, particularly I, I would say picking up in the past five years. So of course I go in and do a review of the literature um, rather frequently because it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And what you see is consistently when people remove food reactions based on IgG sensitivity improvement in various conditions, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, colitis. Uh, you are seeing a lot of this research with depression and things that are neurologic. And so the research guides us into what we want to look at in terms of pathology. Many times people will say, well, what's the right way to look at a reaction to food? And the right way is where we've identified immune confusion in the condition. So if it's an autoimmune condition and we know that antibodies are cross-reacting and attacking tissue, we need to look at an antibody reaction, then remove the foods to calm those antibodies down. If it's a cytokine condition, we need to look at things that will trigger that and complement is one of those things. Complement is the bridge between uh, the innate and the remembered immune system. And so it gives us a way to look at type one, type two, type four hypersensitivity and its relationship to how foods can confuse the immune system and create pathology. Uh, I, some other tests that we want to look at today, we're gonna look at oxidative stress testing. And so at Precision, we do a percent reduced glutathione and total glutathione. So what does that mean exactly? Well, um, the literature will talk about in autoimmune conditions in particular, that you can see a normal level of total glutathione, but the reduced component is what's low. And that's, that's important because the reduced component is going to be what's active, what accepts the free radical. And, and also it guides our treatment. We might do different things to increase glutathione, uh, as acetyl glutathione, different liposomal glutathiones, particularly N-acetylcysteine becomes pertinent to this talk uh, today. Um, but, it, but we might do different things to increase that percent reduced. Things like alpha lipoic acid will do that. Selenium will help to do that. And so looking to know, do I have enough? That's my total. And also, do I have it in the right form? That's, that's very important for uh, conditions. And what we're seeing in the literature is that one of the major things that drives that cytokine storm is a depletion of glutathione. So it's an important time when people are coming in right now. Of course, it's obvious to us that we need to be looking at things like uh, vitamin D or um, fibrinogen or D-dimer that has been shown to when they are abnormal to be predictive of a worse prognosis with COVID. It. But I think it's also important right now to take a snapshot with our patients to say, where's inflammation being created in the body? Is it because of foods you eat? Are you susceptible to oxidative stress? Get a snapshot. What's your level of vitamin D? What's your level of glutathione? And these are the things that we can do to make sure that we're in the best situation uh, if we're exposed to COVID. A secondary piece is that it also makes sure that when we are, when our antioxidant level is up, when our vitamin D level is up, it also prepares us to have an appropriate response to a vaccine as well. So when we're concerned about autoimmune confusion from a vaccine, when we're concerned about it creating too much of a, an inflammatory reaction in the body, those that have normal levels of vitamin D are likely to produce better antibodies to a vaccine without the same confusion. So there are things that we can do to prepare the body to protect us, not only from an infection, but from some of these other um, possibilities out there as well. 
we're going to look at the role of oxidized LDL in this story of the chronically sick patient. Um, it damages the glycocalyx, and we're going to talk more about that. Uh, we do this at Precision Point. It's cheap. It's easy. And I think it's really important, 17 times more predictive than cholesterol itself. And when we are having to make choices about what testing we can do, something simple like this that's highly predictive can be useful. Now, if we have somebody who has an extensive cardiovascular history, maybe had an issue at 35, they're quite abnormal, then we need to be looking at a very extensive workup. And when we think about that, when we think about particle size and buoyancy, why are we measuring those things? Well, you're measuring particle size. Is it buoyant? Is it dense? You're measuring those things to know how easily oxidized it can become. And so just straight up measuring oxidized LDL can be a nice quick snapshot. Also, it directs you not only to whether or not you need to lower lipids, but whether or not your levels of things like CoQ10 are adequate for protecting your lipids as well. I just wanted to mention that we have, um, in my opinion, a very nice wellness profile. It's a chem screen and a CBC. It looks at other things like vitamin D, magnesium, the glutathione that I've mentioned. It does a complete thyroid profile. It does a hormone profile. It does a complete cardiovascular profile. And this is all about around $500 clinician price. So a really nice value for um, a very complete way to get started with a patient. And then on follow-up, you can just pick out the things that are abnormal. So you have a very cost-effective way of moving forward with your patient as well. So let's dig down into some of the physical and in some of the physiological relevance here. And what I want you to note is that in, uh, in the Precision Allergy 88, we are looking at multiple ways that you can react to food. And that's just the long and short of it. There's not one way we react to food. There's multiple ways we do this. And all of these things show up in the literature. Certainly we can look at allergies, but we can see more and more about IgG reactions to food and when they're removed, um, seeing things like um, uh, neutrophils go down, seeing things like C-reactive protein go down, seeing symptoms go down. So uh, a body of research that's really formed around this. Uh, what we also know though is these are not the only two ways that we can react to things. We can also develop a tolerance and that's guided by IgG4. Uh, many will say, well, there's problems with IgG and that's because they do different things. And that is accurate. However, these problems um, become quite well addressed when you tease out the one that does something different. And IgG4 is the one that acts abnormally to the rest, IgG1, 2, and 3. And so in terms of IgG4, it's a tiny little antibody and part of its size dictates why and how it becomes different. One of the things that IgG4 does is it goes and sits in the IgE receptor and blocks IgE from binding, preventing anaphylaxis. And this is a well-known mechanism because when we talk to people that do desensitization or the literature, we look at the literature around desensitization, what we know is that the reason that you inject um, antigens or do them under the tongue is actually not to decrease IgE, but to increase IgG4. And so this tells us how we become tolerant to an IgE reaction. And we, hear, we, we witness this all the time. Patient says, I had a dairy allergy as a child that I grew out of it. And so this is the way that we grow out of things either naturally or stimulated by desensitization therapies. IgG, total IgG is this sensitivity reaction three to 72 hours after, but in, and all of these will cause damage in terms of causing the gut to be leaky, even IgE does that. Um, but I, we're gonna hone in on particularly why complement is important. Complement activates the classic complement cascade and the alternative cascade, recruits cytokines to the area and creates a huge inflammatory response. And so 
if your food is causing a complement reaction that will increase cytokines in your body, and now you bump into any other condition that's going to cause an excess of cytokines like COVID acutely or uh, more chronic conditions like Lyme and mold, and it makes this condition worse. If we are looking for strategies to calm down cytokines, then we need to remove the foods that elicit a complement response because they, they, they upregulate this. And so it becomes particularly important where cytokines are an issue. So which test do you use? Will you use the one that's provoking an immune confusion in the condition that you are looking at? And so, uh, and, th and that's why looking at multiple reactions together become quite useful. Now, as useful as that may be, it can become overwhelming. So if I have all these reactions to foods and four different ways that it can happen, and now I've got to look at highs and lows and in different categories, that can become con very difficult for you to communicate in a, in a visit and for a patient to understand. So then we also take it the next step and we calculate, it's a proprietary formula, this immune index based on levels of your antibodies and complement. And then we give you a total of your most reactive active food to your least reactive food. This is such a useful clinical tool. Why? Maybe you have someone who's never changed their diet before in their life and they're overwhelmed. And you can say to patient, uh, to Mrs. Overwhelmed, you can say, you know what? It's okay. Just focus on the top five. Maybe you had someone who um, what, did not had been on prednisone and they stayed off of it the length of time they were supposed to, but still everything looks suppressed. All their antibody levels are low. Well, you're still gonna be able to rank in the top order which ones did you react the most to? So they did something that was immune suppressive or they just had a condition that's immune suppressive. Even when everything is ramped to the low side, you can still say, okay, well, your immune system's low, but these are the things that you are most reactive to. So a really nice tool for individualizing to people and helping us hone in. Like I mentioned, we look at these measures of oxidative stress. I'm gonna talk more about these. And so here's the prized picture, the one that we are all so familiar with. And so we have a food and something like gluten, and maybe that triggers zonulin to come up here and bind to receptors. And when that happens, these tight junctions get ripped apart and the gut becomes leaky, things leak in, ignite our T cells, and we're off to the inflammatory races. And this leaky gut piece is something that we're quite familiar with. But today I wanna to focus on another area where foods create an impact, and that's here. Now I'm sure when your eyes first look at this, you go, yeah, well, Cheryl, that is just the same uh, leaky gut picture that we're all used to looking at. Check it out again. So now, now we're looking at blood, plasma, and the endothelium. We're looking at the vessels. And here on top is something called the glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx, I believe, is the next frontier, the next leaky gut that we're all going to be thinking about. And this glycocalyx, much like the lining of the gut, regulates what moves from the tissue space or moves from the plasma and into the tissue space. If the glycocalyx becomes worn down and eroded, like which will happen when we have lots of antibodies floating around, whether or not these are IgE or IgG, they begin to lodge in this glycocalyx and begin to decrease its ability to separate the plasma from the endothelium. So antibodies will do that. They make this, uh, uh, they, they begin to erode this. In addition to your IgE reactions that will do this and your IgG reactions that will do this, a huge impact to your glycocalyx are those cytokines. And cytokines are upregulated by complement in that cascade. And so when we're asking what does the most damage to the glycocalyx, it's cytokines followed by uh, immunoglobulins that have, cre that have been created as a confused response to foods. So 
Uh, this glycocalyx is what protects the vessel. This glycocalyx decides if we're going to move things from the blood into the tissue space. The chronic patient becomes ill, loses, yes, their gut lining, but also loses their glycocalyx. So now you are giving um, you know, beautiful amounts of uh, berberines and you are giving beautiful amounts of N acetylcysteine and nutrients and all of these things. And in your patient, uh, nine out of 10 patients, they're all responding a certain way when you do this. But this patient is doing things correctly, uh, can't quite get there, and you are not seeing a change. So one of the things that happens in your chronically ill patient is those cytokines wear away the glycocalyx. And now not only can you not deliver nutrition to the tissue or oxygen to the tissue, but you can't deliver therapy. These are those mold patients and Lyme patients that are stuck. And when we begin to think about microcirculation, well, then our tally in terms of people in the US that need to worry goes way up. Diabetes is a microcirculatory issue. Of course, erectile dysfunction. And what we're learning is that this can be a sequelae of COVID because of the microcirculation damage. Obviously, cardiovascular disease, when the, when the capillary bed or the glycocalyx gets damaged, this is a major first step in terms of plaques being formed. Um, dementia, we can think of as a microcirculatory condition. When we think about some of our favorite therapies, like for example, um, a ginkgo, uh, what, what's the mechanism of action? Well, it's to increase cerebral blood flow, right? So again, focus on that microcirculation piece, delivering more oxygen to the tissue. Uh, if you have a damaged glycocalyx, now cancer cells have an easier time metastasizing. A damaged glycocalyx means you are not delivering oxygen like you should, which will mean uh, that people will become more fatigued and then the, this continues to impact the mitochondria. And so the reasons for fatigue from that continue to be a feed forward uh, problem from there. And we know what we are saying and what we are learning is that it's really this damage to the microcirculatory area, to the capillaries that really end up causing this organ failure. Um, maybe it's the lungs, but you know what I'm hearing from, uh, you know, a number of colleagues, they tell me, yeah, Cheryl, it's no problem. We get people out of the hospital, but they're back here with kidney failure next month because of that microcirculatory damage that's occurred. So right now, more than ever, is a great time to be thinking about what can I do for my vascular system and removing foods that create antibodies, foods that create a complement, therefore a cytokine response is a critical way to build up the glycocalyx. So um, when we have a, this essential lining, when this glycocalyx is intact, what do we have? We have, well, of course we have stronger vessels and that's gonna mean better oxygen delivery to all of your organs. And it's going to mean an improved performance and increased energy, uh, a more youthful appearance, more clear thinking. And so this is the picture of what I'm talking about. Here we are, here's where blood would be flowing through and see how it really just mimics what a gut lining would look like, this little furry glycocalyx. And so it's regulating what makes it from the blood into the tissue space in terms of therapy and also in terms of nutrients, oxygen, et cetera. Another big thing that is regulated by our glycocalyx is white blood cells. And so if we have a nice furry glycocalyx here, white blood cells move through the endothelium like they're supposed to. They stay out in circulation, they do their job, they fight things um, and, and we stay more immune competent. But when this withers away, now what happens is you see a margination of white blood cells. And when they begin to hang out here in the margins, now more inflammation, uh, more damage to the tissue, so more of an inflammatory response. So think of like your rheumatoid arthritis patient or your scleroderma patient, who you're seeing, or your eczema patient, where you're seeing more of this tissue response. Um, also, in when we the glycocalyx wears away from these antibodies, et cetera, even your mast cells uh, will now uh, begin to hang out in the periphery. And if a mast cell hangs out here, begins to release histamine, that's another way things get damaged. I'm sure you're also thinking, huh, another white blood cell that I think about hanging out in the periphery on the side of the vessel, your macrophage. And we know the macrophage is, is the beginning way that we form a plaque. 
the LDL became oxidized. That is the step that means the liver doesn't take it up. The macrophage does. And now where does the macrophage deposit it? Here in the side of the vessel. But a healthy glycocalyx will prevent that. So we keep our glycocalyx healthy by not damaging it, eating foods that create antibodies, damage it, eating foods that create a complement cytokine response damages it. Um, of course, sugar damages it. And so we remove these things that wear away our, glycoca our glycocalyx. So we, we wanna keep the immune cells out, moving around, fighting bugs, not stuck up to the wall, uh, not doing what they should do. And so if we no longer have that glycocalyx, we can't get nutrition into the, the, into the tissue bed, but your therapies don't make it there either. These are those people that just don't respond to natural or conventional antibiotics. They're just not moved by the therapies you'd expect them to be. Uh, problems with our immune system. And so it damages the ability to repair your chronically ill patient gets stuck. Um, so there, so we now you're thinking, okay, um, I need to go back and look at and think about foods that would create these reactions, really focus on that. And isn't that just sometimes what the chronically ill patient needs? Just a moment to really focus on uh, their diet. Uh, other things that build up glycocalyx, if you have hyperbarics in your office, that oxygen tells us to make new capillaries that will have a new glycocalyx as part of that. So, you know, getting back to things like um, oxygen exposure, maybe you don't have hyperbarics. You know what else creates lovely glycocalyx inside and new capillary beds? exercise. So these stuck patients just getting back to a clean diet, telling them to get out there and exercise, to move around. Um, if they have saunas, you know, of course we think about detox with saunas, but I am more and more convinced that the benefit of a sauna is actually this. When you go to PubMed and you look at the data on saunas, it is all about the vasculature. More data about cardiovascular disease than anything else uh, stimulates the endothelium and when we do that, it stimulates the glycocalyx to grow more effectively. So this glycocalyx does a number of things for us. Uh, this is where we produce nitric oxide. So if you have a patient who you cannot get their blood pressure under control, it's time to think about things that are damaging the vessel, and that can be an inflammatory response to food. Uh, maybe another concern you've had is, should I give arginine? Um, because I don't want, what I want is endothelial nitric oxide. I want the E form of this. What I don't want is I don't want uh, the I form of that, the inducible nitric oxide. That's the one that we worry does more damage. So if you want arginine to go right into the endothelium and get sucked up to do its job where it should, a healthy gly glycocalyx will do that. The glycocalyx has um, antioxidant response elements like superoxide dismutase, type 3, type 1s in the mitochondria, type 2 in the cytosol. So making our own antioxidants um, angiotensin converting enzymes. And, and so one of the things that we know about uh, angiotensin and that story is we know that this is one of the key places that COVID, one of the receptors it uses to invade. This is again why we think about it as a microvascular condition. Well, what's gonna protect that receptor from COVID? That's your glycocalyx. And so a number of other things made there, we, we regulate um, some of these cytokines there, chemokines, growth factors, apo, um, apolipid proteins like APOA, which is going to be more protective. Like I mentioned, if we want the, the immune system to be healthy, we want to get the white blood cells back out into the periphery, a healthy glycocalyx is part of how we do that. So when we have microcirculatory impairment, this is what drives chronic disease. Cytokines do that and complement drives cytokine production. So getting the foods out that elicit a complement response is really important always right now. And, you know, and there are certain conditions that are more driven by complement. If I look at what's the immune confusion in rheumatoid arthritis, one, it's antibodies cross-reacting and attacking the tissue. So we want to get rid of foods that cause an antibody response. Um, two, it's cytokines. The, the, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is particularly driven by that. That's one of the reasons most of us would reach for curcuminoids that help to shut that off. Uh, here, here's another way I damage your glycocalyx. If I put oxidized LDL next to it, it, it withers away that protective layer there. Again, makes sense, fits perfectly in with our story in terms of how plaques are formed. So they did this, they cut open your vessel, looked at the glycocalyx, dumped some oxidized LDL next to it, and it caused that to 
wither away, setting up um, more inflammation, um, setting up an increase in um, 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 uh, infl inflammation uh, that cause more plaque formation. And remember, we do this at Precision as a standalone lab, cheap, easy, do I need to lower lipids? Do I need to give more antioxidants? Really guides the type of therapy that we wanna do in integrative medicine as well. Um, so again, uh, other reasons that it can get worn down, uh, low oxygen, absolutely a great way to damage tissue. So again, how do we increase oxygen? Things like hyperbarics, but good old exercise. Um, and glycation, sugar is another beautiful way to wear things down. Hmm, tumor necrosis factor. How do we get more tumor necrosis factor? Well, lots of inflammation, but yeah, I'm sure everyone would have guessed this, leaky gut, huge way that we increase tumor necrosis, necrosis, necrotic factor, causes vessels to become damaged as well. Glycocalyx is also in the GI tract. There on the tips of the microvilli is the same protective coating. And so they looked at this protective coating and when it was eroded, there was less absorption, um, less enzymes, um, particularly those that degrade disaccharides. So we wanna be thinking about this in all of our FODMAP patients. And um, also they did a study with kiddos that had diarrhea. They found the ones that had the lowest level of glycocalyx um, had the most diarrhea then they removed foods based on IgG testing. And what they saw was the glycocalyx was repaired and diarrhea went into remission as well. So it ties all of that together. So the glycocalyx, um, it is, protects us in the vessels. It helps in terms of um, preventing infection, cancer. It helps cells to bind together like they should. It's even involved in um, uh, fertility. And way back at the beginning, when you were an embryo forming, it was necessary to guide the embryonic cells to their destination in the body. So it's a big deal. And, uh, you know, like I mentioned, we are figuring out that one of the major ways um, that the um, COVID enters the body is this angiotensin receptor that is protected by the glycocalyx. So this study just came out, microvascular dysfunction in COVID. And what we know is that foods that we eat can play a, a role in this microvascular dysfunction. We've known this for, for years. I can think back to this many years ago in naturopathic medical school. And one of the things that we learned uh, that I learned at that time is take a pulse, eat the meal, take the pulse again. Did the pulse go up? This is one of the things that told us that the body was reacting to food. Was there a vascular response to what you ate? So we know that this vascular response occurs. And so when we're thinking about conditions of microcirculation, it becomes important to focus on foods. Um, so what they said is that the, the, the data sh showed that when the glycocalyx was worn away, when microcirculation was compromised, these were the patients with, with worse COVID. And so we need to consider how we can improve the vascular response as part of this. So it's more than a passive barrier. Um, and that endothelium, that glycocalyx, um, it's, it's gel-like, it's negatively charged. It's made up of these glycosamine glycans, so these sulfur containing molecules that repel the things that they shouldn't and then pull in the things that should. And so this is a table from that study that showed healthy patients. So our healthy patients um, had better vascular density, i.e. a better glycocalyx. That's what was being measured. Um, patients that were a little less well, here they are, and the ones that ended up on um, ventilation. So what you see is that as the glycocalyx, um, those that um, that, that had a better glycocalyx or more vascular density were less likely to end up on ventilation. And here's another schematic that describes what I've been talking about. So here's the blood moving through the red blood cells, um, delivering oxygen. Um, here's that glycocalyx, that structure that moves things in. Interesting, uh, hyaluronic acid is one of the things that gives it a nice structure here. And sulfate, so N-acetylcysteine is one of the things you wanna think of for building this glycocalyx alongside what's most important is removing the things that cause damage in the first place, inflammatory food reactions, uh, lots of sugar. This is um, borrowed from um, uh, mold talks out there. And so uh, the, the uh, clinicians that are focused on mold talks 
toxicity. Uh, they've been talking about this for years, maybe just in slightly different language. And what they said was, you know, at the capillary bed, all these cytokines, they get lodged here, and now you can't deliver oxygen like you should, and it creates this hypoxic event in the tissue that damages the tissue and keeps people from being well. These cytokines are driven by complement. This same hypoxic event keeps the tissue bed from receiving therapy so it can get well. So mold can cause these cytokines, but food that elicits a complement response will cause these cytokines too, and it's all about lowering the load of cytokines so we don't see this type of damage. Cytokines, so again, they were talking about the capillary bed and before we can make it in there, there's your glycocalyx regulating what happens in the capillary bed. If I'm a, if, and you know, another way to say this, people who are healthy and well have more capillaries. And as we become more chronically ill, you'll see less capillaries. And so people that are more well will have this reserve, even the, the, this part of the capillary bed that's not being utilized. Then I get up, I run from the bear, I've got extra capillaries so that uh, my muscles get what they need. Those uh, who are sick, who are chronically ill, don't have that reserve, so that stress takes it out of them. It's why one event like that, and then they're knocked out. It's because their reserve that, that they don't have the reserves that they need, like those of us who uh, who are healthy do. So again, cytokines will cause this hyperperfusion. That hyperperfusion, less oxygen, um, increases HIF-1, hy hypoxic inducible factor, and that will cause more mitochondrial dysfunction. HIF-1 causes the mitochondria to not work well. It shifts the cell into glycolysis is another way of making energy. This is also known as that Warburg effect, but it's something that can happen uh, that will just make us more fatigued, the mitochondria not working like it should. So like I mentioned, um, creates this effect, also will cause the release of more MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases that continue to chew up the tissue. Uh, these are particularly upregulated, for example, in endometriosis. They chew up normal tissue so the endometrial tissue can move more. Foods that create a complement response in cytokines um, will cause more matrix metalloproteinases. Uh, curcuminoids downregulate MMPs, so uh, kind of ties the story together. This is from Shoemaker and he, he puts these out. So he talks about what happens in the capillary bed um, if this HIF factor is induced. Uh, so you're gonna have less angiogenesis, more inflammation, less oxygen delivery, kind of ties the whole story together there. And so when we're thinking about labs to improve a circulatory response, then we really wanna make sure that we're measuring foods that would have a, that, that would trigger a complement response. These are going to trigger, a, they're going to activate that, that um, alternative and classic complement cascade, and that's going to produce more cytokines, a feed forward. You see more chemotaxis and more recruitment of more white blood cells to the area. And so what we know is that when there is both complement with IgG, it amplifies the reaction a thousand to 10,000 fold. So this might be another complaint people have with IgG is they say, well, sometimes the higher titer is not always the worst symptom. And that's true, but adding complement to that really helps to kind of fine tune and hone in on that. Um, when when, when complement is present with IgG, this can make even a smaller titer uh, more inflammatory. And so it helps you to explain to your patient why the smaller titer to milk with complement is really a big deal and they need to get it out of the diet. And so here again, this is talking about um, what you see with food allergies. You see that IgG creates more um, vascular permeability. We knew this already. That's part of you know, that inflammation and edema and swelling. I'm sure you have patients that will can you know show you their fingers and they plump up like little sausages when they've been eating the things that they haven't. This is that antibody response lodging in the tissue causing more vascular hyperpermeability. Um, and then, like I mentioned, food sensitivities, IgG reactions to foods also damage the glycocalyx. They measured that. And so if we are concerned about what is doing damage to the glycocalyx, we know that IgG reactions do this as well. Um, what we don't want is to have a test result that's so overwhelming to somebody that they just throw their hand in the air and they go, I can't do anything with this. So 
Absolutely. The most clinically correct response is to remove any food that creates a level of inflammation. <clears throat> and then you have the patient <clears throat> that may or may not um, find that very realistic or uh, this is new to them. And so we give you two different diets. We give you a more restrictive diet that pulls out all the highs and all the moderates and then rotates the moderates and lows that also have complement present since those are so extreme. And then we do a less restrictive diet that just takes out the highs. And this is just to give you some flexibility. You know, they're there in tears, they can't manage it all. Okay, I just want you to focus on, you know, the, 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 these, these handful of foods right now. Or, you know, they have a, a rapidly progressing MS or they're a very sensitive mold patient and uh, they're just reacting everywhere, everywhere they go. Well, they need to tighten up and they need to eliminate anything that's creating inflammation in the body. You'll also see we put IgG4 in a separate condition, or a column, sorry. And that's because, like I mentioned many times, IgG4 is protective. However, there are a handful of conditions called IgG4-related disease. Um, eosinophilic esophagitis is one of these. So IgG4 is where the immune confusion is. So in this case, you would actually want to remove uh, foods that have an IgG4 reaction. Autoimmune thyroiditis is another one that the, the major damage to the thyroid is actually not um, thyroglobulin antibodies. It's interesting. It's complement and IgG4. So you want to remove foods that create a complement response or create an IgG4 response in somebody uh, with Hashimoto's. And we have some nice physician guides that give you tables of different conditions that are more driven by parts of the immune system. Here are conditions that are more driven by complement. So I really need to focus on the C3D. Here are conditions that are more driven by IgG4. So I really need to focus on those. Our atopic conditions, our allergies, our, our, our eczema, our asthma, we know IgE with a good, nice scoop of IgG on the side. Um, so so um, we want to identify where the immune confusion is in that condition and then focus on the food that's provoking immune confusion in that area. Um, this is looking at the glycocalyx and saying, okay, we really stressed it out. We dumped a bunch of sugar there. And what we saw is that you could, per that you could prevent um, degradation of the glycocalyx by things like glutathione or N-acetylcysteine. So in that chronically ill patient, part of the issue is therapy is no longer being delivered to the tissue bed because that glycocalyx is no longer in place. Remove the foods that are damaging it get the sugar out, increase the antioxidants, take a break, have them do exercise, some hyperbarics um, to, to improve that glycocalyx, get some N-acetylcysteine on board. Remember, I, I said that it is a sulfur, um, that you, we use sulfur aminos to create that glycocalyx layer. Well, cysteine is one of your sulfur containing amino acids, so it makes sense that it would be helpful here and also blocks that receptor for COVID as well. So N-acetylcysteine is just a really nice go-to nutrient in my opinion. Uh, measure your levels of glutathione. If somebody is glutathione deficient, uh, they are more likely to have bigger issues with COVID. And so you, you can just tease out glutathione and do it by itself. The, 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 you, no, actually, you get the total and the percent reduced. We don't tease those out separately. But, you know, take an opportunity. Do a vitamin D level. Do a glutathione level. These are things that we can do to improve our resistance. And so here's what that... Um, what that profile looks like that measures these, the, these oxidative stress, like I mentioned, total glutathione, but that percent reduced, are you getting it in the form that you can actually use it? F2 isoprostane is a marker of lipid peroxidation, our fats being damaged. And we do, we are beginning to see some relationship to this. The higher it is, the more damaged the glycocalyx. I would actually say your go-to here for what damages even more and is more established in the literature is your oxidized LDL. Um, 8-OHDG, this goes up when we're more glutathione deficient. Uh, this is a marker of DNA damage. It goes up as a precursor to cancer. It, it, if you have a cancer, high 8-OHDG is associated with it being more aggressive. Um, and if you are in remission from cancer, a high 8-OHDG is associated with more reoccurrence. So it's a marker of free radical damage to the DNA, not just the DNA and the nucleus, 
but also the DNA and the mitochondria. So when it's high, you know, you also have mitochondrial damage as well. It's a, it's a real nice snapshot. It's, you know, and if we know that somebody has a higher level of oxidative stress right now, they're more fragile from infections or chronic disease as well. And so measuring these things can really help us know how much antioxidants, how much glutathione, um, how, how much CoQ10, well, what's enough to put their body in a reduced state? Have you, have you done enough to protect the DNA? Have you done enough to protect lipids? Have you done enough to increase the major intercellular antioxidant in the brain, in the lung, in the liver, in the kidney, for starters? <laughs> And then markers of um, how leaky the gut is, of course, this, uh, so we do this as well. Um, do know that right now that we are um, running a special through the end of the year and that you can get uh, this, this test that looks at intestinal permeability with our um, precision antigen test. Both of those are combined right now for the same test of um, the food. So this is a perfect time to say to your patients, hey, let's get a snapshot. Let's see how leaky your gut is. This lets me know, can I decrease the glutamine now? Can I decrease um, some of the probiotics? So we know zonulin tells tight junctions to open. That's one way we get leaky. You can also just wear down the gut lining um, and that atrophy. And you'll see diamine oxidase go down when there's more atrophy. We make this in the gut lining. This is one of those enzymes we make there in the glycocalyx. So it also degrades histamine. So when it goes down, we'll have more trouble with histamine. A measurement of histamine is nice because this is one of the things that damages the glycocalyx as well. Do you have enough diamine oxidase to your histamine? And then LPS, this can damage tight junctions too. So we measure this immune response to it. If you're making all this, uh, these antibodies to LPS, it's another thing that can damage the glycocalyx. We also know LPS itself damages that, damages tight junctions. It's one more way we can get leaky. And once LPS leaks in, a huge host of effects. Um, it can damage lipids. It can create oxidized LDL. It can damage the heart. Um, LPS um, can damage the brain. So it's, a, it's associated with you know, quite a number of chronic conditions out there. You can just, just keep an eye open on your um, chem screens, um, your albumin. Uh, it will begin to drift into the vascular, into the tissue space when the, t when, the, when the glycocalyx is worn down and you become more permeable. So I always like to see an albumin generally above a four. And I'll talk to patients about if it's less than a four, then that means maybe you don't have enough protein, but maybe you also have a leaky glycocalyx. Um, albumin functions as an antioxidant. So when you see it low, you want to think about getting more antioxidants up. And like I mentioned, our comprehensive wellness panel gives you all the basic things, IGF, um, your, it gives you albumin, it gives you immunoglobulins, gives you CBC, um, vitamin D, magnesium, glutathione, percent and total reduced. It gives you all those ox stress markers we just talked about. Um, it walks through a complete thyroid profile, including your antibodies, uh, a hormone profile and a cardio profile. So this is a really nice way um, to get people started. And then, like I mentioned, you can just measure the individual analytes to, to help them afterwards after you've gotten more of a complete assessment like this. We always like to know a little bit about what to do about these things. So um, of course, removing foods that trigger complement, that is one of our biggest harms to the glycocalyx. So removing um, foods that create this is quite important. And other things that you wanna think about, um, optimize your antioxidants, like we mentioned, particularly in acetylcysteine and glutathione. They're both sulfur containing and will build that glycocalyx. Glucosamine sulfate, that's interesting, right? We think of it for joints, but really that synovial fluid, sulfur, repelling things, making it slippery. Uh, it, it, so some of the same things that happen in the synovial fluid are some of the same things that are happening in your glycocalyx as well. Um, olive oil helps to build it. That makes sense. We knew that olive oil, Mediterranean diet, low risk for cardiovascular disease, that probably ties all this together. When we want healthy vessels, we think about resveratrol. Um, it, it, angiogenesis, right? Um, and I would call it an angiogenesis adaptogen because in conditions where you have too much angiogenesis like cancer or even like obesity where um, more angiogenesis to fat cells to feed them more and more, um, 
we, we know resveratrol will decrease angiogenesis. However, in conditions like um, scleroderma, we also know that resveratrol will increase angiogenesis and improve vessels. So very cool, the wisdom that our botanicals give us, this resveratrol will help angiogenesis where it is not enough, and then also downregulate it where it's too much. Grape seed extract helps your glycocalyx, hyaluronic acid, like I mentioned, hyperbarics, Modified citrus pectin, um, really great at building the glycocalyx to pull things out of the tissue space. We kind of knew that it did some things with detoxification. Um, this might be one more way by which that's the case. So uh, thank you guys for hanging out with me and, and looking at some of this and thinking about just one more way that making our diet less inflammatory helps the system overall. Uh, and it's not just leaky gut, but it's leaky vessels as well. And I think that this is a really important piece in, in helping our chronic patients um, move past those roadblocks and start to start feeling well again. So I'll breathe and then I'll be happy to answer some questions here at the time that we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Burdett. Uh, we do have a few questions. Yeah. Your oxidative stress panel, are you measuring intercellular glutathione or serum? Intercellular, thank you. And that's how we're able to get the percent reduced and um, uh, um, total as well. And that cell is, it's nice. It gives a lab a little advantage because it protects the glutathione. It keeps it um, from being oxidized at, at least for a bit, for about 72 hours. And then when it comes on site, we lyse the cell and measure those two components at that moment. So uh, the, the intercellular space is nice because it, it, it gives us that exact, or not exact picture, but a closer picture. So as to what's happening on a tissue space. Where does IgA testing for allergies come in? Um, it's important and uh, we offer that as well. Um, the way that I think that you can think about IgA is that it's probably going to create more gut-based reactions. That isn't to say that you don't get gut-based reactions from IgG and IgG. IgG and IgE. Unfortunately, the immune system is very interrelated and we can't really just say, this one causes this disease, this one causes this, it'd be nice if it worked that way, but it doesn't. Um, so the IgA in general will create more of a gut-based response because that's where we produce more of it. However, it can have a systemic impact too. There are these immune cells called the Peyer's patches and they take in IgA created in the gut and part of that contributes to our systemic amounts of IgA as well. So there is, of course, some crosstalk between the gut and what happens systemically. But if we're trying to kind of, for learning purposes and matching it with patients, generally gut-based symptoms, generally less systemic, but not completely because nothing in the immune system acts in isolation. What are your thoughts on endocalyx and other products that address calyx directly? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm learning more and more about uh, endocalyx or endocalyx and uh, I'm uh, getting really excited about some of the things that I'm learning about it, um, putting it to use in some of those more chronically ill patients that um, are stubborn and can't move forward. And just an, another avenue to try um, when we have really like, ah, detox the bejeebies out of them and, um, and really just uh, need something else to move them forward. Great data with cardiovascular disease, of course. Um, and so oxidized LDL is a nice one to know. Do you need it? Because again, that's one of the major things that will damage it. Um, but I, you know, I think what we're learning is that microcirculation is, contributes to so many conditions out there, the health of our microcirculatory environment. What about in older healthy clients? Yeah, sadly, uh, we do all start to have some um, diminishing of our glycocalyx and it can drive aging. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's another place to think. But again, you probably were already going to reach for some of these tools um, like, um, like the endocalyx that you mentioned has glucosamine sulfate in it. So probably 
as we get older, we were all thinking glucosamine sulfate that that research just came out that said glucosamine sulfate is one of the things that's associated with living longer and the, and it mimicked uh, or, or its efficacy was similar to exercise. So interesting protects the joints, but the glycocalyx as well in our older patients, or when we're thinking anti-aging, you were probably already thinking antioxidants and in acetylcysteine, the build glutathione protects the glycocalyx as well. So, um, something new to think about, but something that you were probably already treating with some of your other strategies like food removal. Are there any published research studies on your food allergy test? Uh, there are plenty of, um, uh, so there are plenty of published studies in terms of IgE reactions to foods, IgG reactions to foods, IgG4 reactions to foods, and uh, complement reactions to foods. You can find tons of that data um, throughout PubMed, and then we put it all together. So yes, and not just done by the, the, the lab itself, but done looking at those antibodies um, in many centers and many situations, and so... Um, uh, in multidisciplinary, multi-center kind of ways. Does PP take insurance for all cash based or all cash based? We do take insurance uh, and we are and both, we do both. And we'll work with you to, um, to look at your patient and see if their insurance is gonna qualify or not. Do PEMF mats help glycocalyx? What's the acronym? P-E-M-F. Um, I, I don't know what the acronym is, so I'm not sure. Pulsed electromagnetic field. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so I would think because it does help the vasculature, that's probably part of its mechanism. I haven't looked specifically to see if we have related the two, but that, that's a very interesting point. So I bet you're on to something there. Right, let's see here. It looks like that is all the questions that we have. Thank you so very much, Dr. Burdett, for a wonderful presentation. It was very informative lecture. We've had, had comments coming in all day on a, a great lecture. So thank you so very much. Um, I'd like to thank Precision Point Diagnostics and to all of our attendees for staying on today and engaging with some excellent questions. We will see you bright and early tomorrow morning uh, for our first session starting at 9 a.m. Central Time. Thank you all again so very much.